the Americas between A.D. 400 and 421. Moroni, the last Nephite prophet, would finish the record of his father, Mormon. He would write the records and hide them in the earth. And then it did not matter where he went. He was alone, for his father and all his relatives had been slain in battle, and he had no friends and no place to go. At this time, 400 years had passed away since the coming of the Lord. He did not make himself known to the Lamanites, for they put to death every Nephite who would not deny the Christ. And Moroni would not deny the Christ, so he wandered wherever he could for the safety of his own life. I knew that the person who brought this record to light would be blessed. The record would be brought out of darkness into light, and it would be done by the power of God. Moroni wrote to us as if we were present, even though we were not. But Jesus Christ had shown us to him, and he knew our doings. And he exhorted us to come to Christ and be perfected in him. To deny ourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all our might, mind, and strength. Then the grace of God would be sufficient for us. Moroni bid us farewell, for he would soon go to rest in the paradise of God until his spirit and body would again unite. And he would be brought forth triumphant through the air to meet us before the pleasing bar of the great Jehovah, the eternal judge of both quick and dead. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, under the direction of the First Presidency and Council of the Twelve, presents
How Rare a Possession, The Book of Mormon. In 1827, an event prophesied for centuries took place in western New York State. Its coming had been prayed for by numerous ancient Christians. Its occurrence had been spoken of by Jesus Christ himself. It was the coming forth of one of the most important messages ever prepared by God for man. Nearly all of its contents had been carefully written over a period of centuries by prophets of God who were personal witnesses of Jesus Christ. Prophets who had been visited and tutored by angels and translated beings. Their writings were compiled and condensed, and the resulting record was revealed in the 19th century by an angel of God. It was on the evening of September 21, 1823, Moroni, an ancient American prophet, appeared as a resurrected messenger sent from the presence of God to deliver a message to a young man named Joseph Smith. He said there was a book deposited, written upon gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and the source from whence they sprang. He also said, that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it, as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants. Joseph Smith. Four years of preparation followed. Then, during the early hours of September 22, 1827, Joseph left his father's home in rural Manchester and traveled two miles to a nearby hill. Here, by divine appointment, the sacred record passed from immortal to mortal hands. The work of translation, a miracle wrought by the gift and power of God, commenced in a small three-room dwelling in Harmony, Pennsylvania, and culminated in the log home of Peter Whitmer, Sr., near Fayette, New York. And now, after centuries of effort and sacrifice, we are the recipients of a priceless spiritual treasure. I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. And a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. Joseph Smith. The Lord has been operating for centuries to prepare the way for the coming forth of that book from the bowels of the earth to be published to the world, to show to the inhabitants thereof that he still lives and that he will in the latter days gather his elect from the four corners of the earth. Brigham Young. The Book of Mormon cost the best blood of the 19th century. John Taylor. Many years ago, a young man gave up all he possessed in a search for truth that finally led him to the Book of Mormon. His name was Parley P. Pratt. In the spring of 1830, I was married and settled in a small home in the midst of a clearing made with my own hands near the Black River in Ohio. It was a beautiful, quiet place with a garden, thriving orchard, and fields of grain. About this time, my brother William, whom I had not seen for years, came to visit. My little brother, I am impressed. When we were together last, you had nothing. And now look at this. It would be difficult to leave it all. Leave it? Why? past several months, the Holy Spirit has wrought so powerfully on me, I can't rest. The scriptures, William, the prophecies, you've read them. Important things are coming. I feel I have to devote my time to enlightening my fellow man and in warning them to prepare for the coming of the Lord. As a minister? No, I don't have any authority. I doubt anyone has. See, that's the great missing link, William, the authority to minister in holy things.
but I feel duty-bound to enlighten mankind so far as God has enlightened me. If I had 50 acres of land, comfortable house, fields of grain, beautiful garden, fine orchard, I'm sure I would stay and enjoy it while I lived. The world might go on its merry way for all I care. You've toiled for years to obtain this. Why not enjoy it? Whoever shall forsake houses and lands for my sake shall receive an hundredfold and life everlasting. Are those the words of Jesus Christ? I believe the Bible partly. I wouldn't dare believe it literally. I feel called upon by the Holy Ghost to forsake my house and home for the gospel's sake. I plan to rely on the Lord's promises. If you think they are false. If I am sustained, they are true. Godspeed, brother. We parted. He to his business. I to my preparations for a mission which would only end with my life. In August 1830, I sold my farm, completed my arrangements, and we bid adieu to our wilderness home, never to see it afterwards. The Erie Canal, near Rochester, New York, August 1830. I thought you'd gone to bed. I had. And then I discovered I was missing a husband. I need to leave the boat and stop a while in this region. Why? I don't know. But the spirit has plainly manifest that much to me. Go to our friends in Albany. And I'll come soon. How soon? I'm not sure. I have something to do here in this region. Exactly what or how long it will take me, I just don't know. But I'll come when it's finished. I took leave of her and of the boat and early the next morning walked 10 miles into the country. Good day, sir. Well, good morning to you, stranger. I stopped to breakfast with a Mr. Fred, Wells and proposed to preach in the evening. He kindly accompanied me through the neighborhood to visit the people and circulate the appointment. A Baptist deacon, name of Hamlin. He's a good soul. <laughs> sit, sit, Isaac. How are you, Thomas? Fine. Isaac, this is Mr. Pratt from Ohio. He's on his way to Albany. Albany? You're a bit off the beaten path, aren't you, boy? Mr. Pratt is a preacher of sorts. In fact, he will be preaching at my home this evening. You'll join us, won't you? Do you preach the scriptures, young man? I do. Good. I'll be there. Seven o'clock. We'll be looking for you. Mr. Pratt, are your views of the scriptures broad enough to accept such things as visions and the ministering of angels? They are. Come, sit. What is it, Isaac? Last week, I came across a book, a strange book, published down in Palmyra, said to have been originally written on plates of brass or gold by a branch of the tribes of Israel, and discovered and translated by a young man by the aid of heaven. 
There's even been talk of the ministry of angels. This book, do you have one? Loaned it to my sister. She'll be returning it in the morning, though, if you care to stop by. I will, if it's agreeable. I felt a strange interest in that book. The next morning, I called at his house, where for the first time, my eyes beheld the Book of Mormon. That book of books. The door's open. It's there on the table. Help yourself. I opened it with eagerness and read its title page. I then read the testimony of several witnesses in relation to the manner of its being found and translated. I commenced its contents by course. I read all day. Care for some supper, Mr. Pratt? Eating was a burden. I had no desire for food. Sleep was a burden when the night came, for I preferred reading to sleep. As I read, the Spirit of the Lord was upon me, and I knew and comprehended that the book was true, as plainly and manifestly as a man comprehends and knows that he exists. Do you know what's in this book? I haven't been able to hold on to it long enough to find out. I don't know how to thank you. My joy was now full, and I rejoiced sufficiently to more than pay me for all the sorrows, sacrifices, and toils of my life. I'm on my way to Palmyra. My book. I soon determined to see the young man who had been the instrument of its discovery and translation. I accordingly visited the village of Palmyra, and inquired for the residence of a Mr. Joseph Smith. Thank you very much. I found it some two or three miles from the village, near the close of day. Evening. Howdy. I'm looking for Mr. Joseph Smith. Translator of the Book of Mormon. Well, he lives in Pennsylvania now. It's about 100 miles from here. I'd be pleased to speak with his father or any member of the family. Well, his father's away on a journey right now, but this is his home, and I'm his brother. Pleased to meet you. My name is Pratt, Parley Pratt. Mr. Pratt, Hiram Smith. I informed him of the interest I felt in the book and of my desire to learn more about it. He welcomed me to his house. And since neither of us felt disposed to sleep, we conversed most of the night. His kingdom should be conducted in the last days. These meetings took place every year for four years, until finally, when he was sufficiently prepared, the Lord entrusted him with the plates. Joseph said that a messenger descended in a cloud of light. When did this happen? Uh, 15th of May, to be exact. This is a new dispensation, Mr. Pratt. A new commission. Angels have visited the earth. Authority has been restored. And Israel is being gathered a final time in preparation for the second coming of the Lord. How far to your next appointment? About 30 miles. But I'll return when it's finished. Well, please do. We'd be glad to have you. Uh, could you use this? 
Please, take it. It's a token of our friendship. Thank you. You're welcome. You have a safe trip. I traveled on a few miles, and stopping to rest, I commenced again to read the book. To my great joy, I found that Jesus Christ, in his glorified, resurrected body, had appeared to the ancient inhabitants of the American continent, that he had taught them his gospel and healed their sick, and that many of his teachings had been preserved here in this book in purity. I esteemed this book or the information contained in it more than all the riches of the world. Yes, I verily believe that I would not at that time have exchanged the knowledge I then possessed for a legal title to all the beautiful farms, houses, villages, and property which passed in review before me on my journey through one of the most flourishing settlements of western New York. Such was the Book of Mormon. Sometimes it seems we take the Book of Mormon too much for granted because we do not fully appreciate how rare a thing it is to possess it and how blessed we are because we do have it. Brothers and sisters, each of us at some time in our lives must discover the Book of Mormon for ourselves. And not just discover it once, but rediscover it again and again. The First Presidency.